So uh, let us make start. So uh, for this session, this is the first session of emergency technology and behavior. So uh, in this session, we have two speakers, and uh, our first speaker is Colin uh, Lockling. So and he will talk about the investigation relationship between the virtual learning environment and engagement and academic and outcome. So please welcome. Thank you very much, Jazz. Thank you all for coming. Uh, big crowd, excellent. Uh, I haven't done this for a few years, so I'm quite nervous and I like to pace up and down, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, my uh, colleague, Ben, is a statistician. Are there any statisticians here? Good, that's what I like to hear. So I, so I, can, I can bluff away quite uh, happily uh, in, in that knowledge. Um, I started getting interested in uh, VLE analytics a few years ago, and at my previous institution, I noticed a uh, uh, sort of a trend that I didn't get a chance to investigate. Uh, so I've inv investigated it this year, and it's all to do with the amount of time that students spend uh, in the VLE. Um, the the big buzzword in HE at the moment is engagement. If we can just get the students to engage. Um, everything will be all right. Uh, but will it? Is, is there such a thing as too much engagement? Uh, and, and the spoiler is, uh, yes, there probably is. Um, and the other thing is that I haven't looked at this for a couple of weeks. So I've got to see what's, uh, I don't actually know what's on the slides. Um, <laughs> what does this student engagement look like? In our terms, it's um, how long they spend in the VLE, and my particular project was how long they spend in the content in the VLE, not in any other area. So not in whether we're on a homepage or in the discussion forum or in any of the uh, any of those other so ancillary things. It's just purely whether they're in, in the content areas. Up until a few years ago, um, it was very difficult to provide any correlations between face-to-face -face teaching and engagement with the VLE, generally because the stuff on the VLE was so poor uh, that the, the students, whether they engaged with it or not, was, was not a really accurate reflection of what was happening in the course. That seems to have changed uh, in the last five years. And we've, we, we have been able to prove um, we have been able to prove correlations between engagement. There's generally now a correlation uh, between engagement and uh, the, the amount of time they spend in the VLE. But I, the other thing I've noticed, and particularly since the pandemic, is far more of this, far more of lecturers coming in and saying, where are the students? They're not engaging. Uh, and, and these are all <laughs> lecturers who are posting pictures of their empty, empty lecture rooms. And I was wondering if that's the same with the VLE. You know, as I say, the focus is on engagement. If we can just get them to engage, everything will be okay. And it's, it's sort of seen as the, the holy grail. If we can just get them to engage, that will be fine. So um, the, uh, the definitions are, of student engagement are uh, time and efforts students devote to educationally, educationally purposeful activities, and that includes activities such as attending class, submitting assignments, interacting with lecturers and peers. And the authors identify uh, different dimensions, dimensions of engagement, including behavioral, emotional, and cognitive. I'm looking at behavioral. I'm, I'm looking at how they behave with the VLE. Um, and <clears throat> unlike uh, some institutions, we haven't got a great deal of money or a great deal of time. So I'm looking for relatively simple measures of engagement. Um, the, the measures remain complex. They often remain differentiated by discipline. So different disciplines have different levels of engagement with the VLE, different ways of uh, uh, doing, doing that. The 
individual students, their individual psychology means that they engage with their learning in different ways. So you can't always, you cannot predict from student engage, individual student engagement what their outcomes are likely to be. And the other thing is that the correlations with the VLE are often weak. So there's generally a correlation. There's generally a positive correlation between the amount of time they spend in the VLE and their uh, academic outcomes as, as measured by uh, exam results. But the correlations are generally weak. Um, so in an effort to refine the relationship, a lot of, uh, a lot of people with more time and money than we have um, start looking into you know, really complex dimensions of, of how they're going to model it, uh, including demographics of students and all that sort of thing. Um, but um, <laughs> other people have pointed out that there are, there are correlations with um, uh, students who have high activity and high grades and other students have high activity, low grades, but they're generally uh, in the past, in the literature, they've, they've generally been dismissed kind of as outliers, really. Um, so, yeah, as I say, the, the student engagement with the VLE, it, it's, it remains complex. Um, uh, but it is it can be a proxy it's not a direct relationship there isn't a direct relationship between the VLE and our academic outcomes but it is a reasonable proxy so the most basic unit of learning data in virtual learning environments is the interaction and there's no consensus yet on which interactions are meaningful for uh, for uh, demonstrating effective learning so i want to talk about the data that i was looking at i was looking at because because the correlations were weak uh, which i already knew i was only looking at large cohorts so i was looking at cohorts with more than 200 students or at least more more than 200 students enrolled and i was taking the amount of time they spent in the VLE measured in seconds. Uh, and this is just in the VLE content in no other areas. Uh, and then their exam scores. And as we can see in this, this particular one, there is a correlation and it's 0.46, which is about, which is, which is actually quite strong for a VLE correlation. Uh, they're normally, they're, they're generally a bit weaker than that. And the, the correlation line here, just for anyone who doesn't know, so this is the best fit line for, uh, for all the students. So if you take all the, all the dots which represent individual students, that's the neatest line you can take through. And the steepness of the line indicates the strength of the correlation and the spread indicates how, how, uh, how strong the correlation is. If it was a stronger correlation, the dots would be closer to the line. Ah, Can yes. I tell you the speaker. Sorry. The speaker and sound. Oh, oh, right. Okay. Okay. Beg your pardon. <clears throat> okay. All the modules I looked at had a correlation. Um, again, it, it varied, but it's, it was, it was a sim, similar-ish sort of pattern. <laughs> so these are then the averages. So this is the, um, uh, don't worry too much about the fact that the, the average was only 40.42.8%. That's a, a different conversation uh, that, that so many students failed, but the uh, that's the average that's the mean and that is the mean of the time spent in the VLE which was 60 hours in this case so this is a module the all these modules are, are 15 credit modules which is equivalent to 150 hours of study <laughs> and in this case they spent 60 of those hours looking at content in the VLE so these students in this quadrant 
are the students who don't engage very much with the VLE and don't score very well. So that's not probably a massive surprise. These students spend more than average in the VLE, but also score higher than average, which again, probably not a massive surprise. These are the lucky ones who spend not very much time in the VLE, um, but still score pretty well. And these are the students I've always been concerned with. The students who spend more than average in the VLE, but score less than average in the VLE. And, and as I say, in the literature previously, they've kind of been dismissed as uh, outliers um, and not really discussed in any meaningful way. But actually, there's quite a number of them. And my view has always been that, you know, in terms of engagement, these are people who are willing to put in some time but are not getting the rewards out of it. So, uh, uh, you know, that's the purpose of this really is to try and pick up on these people and give them some extra support. So in this particular case, this, this individual here has spent 217 hours in the VLE. Now, I know that they could have put their computer on and left it on whatever multiple times, but you'd have to do that a hell of a lot to get up to 217 hours. <laughs> bearing in mind that the entire study time allocated for this module is only 150 hours. That meant they've done more than that just doing the VLE without doing anything else. Um, and, and clearly, as they scored 42%, their time could probably have been better spent. So I've sort of enlarged it to include that whole group, the whole group that are, that are are spending far more than average in the VLE, but, uh, uh, but achieving less. The interesting thing is, as I say, this, this line, this regression line applies to the whole cohort. And people don't generally look beyond that. But because I was interested in this group here, I did. And when I did a regression just on that group, it becomes inverse which means that the more time you spend in the VLE, the worse you're likely to do, which is obviously counterintuitive. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm definitely not suggesting that the VLE is causing them to do worse, just that, that the, uh, the people in, in this sort of area are spinning their wheels and no matter how long they spend in the VLE, they're not gonna improve their, their scores. So that goes to an inverse correlation of uh, uh, 0.135, which is you know, not very huge, but it is inverse. <clears throat> so that's when I brought in the statistician, because I thought, well, I've got a, a more complex model than a simple linear regression here. Um, so where are we? In the, uh, yeah, so that's it, yeah. The more time the students spent in the VLE, the worse their, their, score, right, their exam scores. Now, it's, it's important to say that this, this is very limited in that I'm only looking at the VLE, I'm only looking at exam scores, and, and we all know there's, that learning is far more complex than that, so, but, but I've reduced it down to a very simple uh, measure. The, the interesting thing I found, and I've not had time to explore this further yet, is that if you take the Panopto views, just the views of the videos of the lectures, you don't get the same thing. If I look at that, the relationship stays positive. In fact, it even increases uh, the more time they spend in, in, in that, that content. So there's something peculiar, which is the next part of my project, uh, is to understand what it is that they're doing in the VLE or not doing. Because as I say, it doesn't stack up with Panopto views, the, the lecture recording views. So, this is a summary of the modules I looked at. This is the cohort size. Uh, one had 170, the rest were all over, over 200. And what I'm looking for is patterns. What I'm looking for is something I can hook onto to, to, to provide an intervention. And as I say, I covered uh, across six modules, I covered four different disciplines. And when I was looking at it before, I covered yet another discipline, same pattern in all of them. Um, but interestingly, uh, at the meantime, in the VLE, this one here is 12 hours. 
and that one there is 73 hours. So there are obviously uh, across the disciplines, there are very different um, uh, requirements, different levels of content. Um, the learning design is obviously very different in those modules. So that's that's kind of understandable because different disciplines. I have no idea what the learning design is in any of these modules. Um, I can't even remember the disciplines now, but uh, so there's no pattern there. There's nothing. There's nothing to really hook on to, just purely with the number of hours. There's also the, the R squared number is just the uh, the strength of the correlation, and as I say, the one that we were looking at was. 0.56, I think, 4.56, which is actually quite strong for a VLE correlation. They're not normally that strong. Um, and then the weakest one uh, was down to 0.19, uh, which is very weak. And uh, what it means, what that means is for those, uh, the uninitiated, is that, so for instance, in the 0.191, uh, it means that the, the, their interaction with the VLE can account for about 19% of the, the, the result as a percentage. Um, oh, come back. But again, there's no real pattern there and there's no real pattern here. So I was looking at the point at which they inverted. So uh, they, when, the, when the correlation went from positive to a, ne a negative relationship, I was looking at what point that was. But again, very wide variation. So at one, on one of them, it was just over 100%, just over 100% of the mean and the relationship inverted. For another one, it was nearly 400%, nearly four times the, the average before the, that relationship inverted. So again, there's nothing, there was nothing really for me to hook into there. But this was interesting. So at double the mean, at double the average time spent. So... In this one, average was 12 hours. When you get up to 24 hours spent, then the relationship disappears. The positive relationship between time spent in the VLE and their exam results disappears, which means that no matter once you get to that point, no matter how long they spend in the VLE, they're unlikely to improve their uh, outcomes. And for me, that's the, that's the gold because it's a really simple measure that and it also doesn't rely on anything most of the models uh for picking up struggling students uh, rely on some kind of feedback some kind of exam or some kind of uh, formative assessment where you can measure their scores and see how they're doing this doesn't need it because all i'm looking at is how much time they're spending in the vle and i can tell after about three weeks who's spending double uh, the the the, uh, the time of everybody else, and and that gives me a clue then to to you know start our intervention. So this is just generalizing that pattern I've been describing. <coughs> so there's the correlation, positive correlation. That's double the mean. That's double the time, the average time that they spend in the VLE. This is the point which it becomes no significant difference. And then at some point after that, it actually inverts. So when I, when I first discovered this, um, I, had a, I had a conversation with ChatGTP and it assured me that change point analysis was, the, was the, what I was looking at. And change point analysis, uh, and I liked it. I liked the name. I thought that's cool. We'll go with that. Um, so change point analysis using Bayesian methods is a statistical method that aims to identify the point at which a significant changing occurs in the parameters of the model. In this method, a Bayesian framework is used to estimate the location of the change point. At the time, I was thinking that would be useful. Uh, but as I've discovered that the, the, but the point at which that changes is so variable, it, it's actually not going to be that useful. It's interesting, and, and we, can, we can use it to predict, uh, or, or Ben can use it to predict all sorts of interesting things, but only really with hindsight. It can't predict stuff. Uh, it can't, 
we can't say using this method at what point students are going to start struggling. We can only really use it and analyze it once we've once we've completed our, 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 our uh, uh, um, sort of courses. When I went to Ben, uh, he said that I was completely wrong to use Bayesian change point analysis uh, for reasons which I can't remember now. And he wants to use this locally estimated scatterplot smoothing, um, which is a form of polynomial regression. Well, actually, I think Bayesian change point is as well. But the um, it's a different type of pattern. And basically, it breaks, it breaks instead of taking the linear regression as one long line, it breaks it down into a, into a much smaller series of, of straight lines. So you still get, it's still a re linear regression, but it's a, it's a series of linear regressions. And what we end up with is a kind of a, a U shape, really, uh, at the end of the day. I'm not sure if I've got, I thought I, I'm, I'll, I'll maybe come back to that because I think he's given me he's given me an estimation of, of what it looks like. But basically, all the patterns are, are horseshoe shape. <laughs> but I kind of lost interest in the stats when I realized that it's not going to tell me anything useful in real time. It's, it's nice for analyzing afterwards, but in real time, all I need to know is that at double the average, um, that's when the students, uh, 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 we need to think about an intervention. So the next steps for this project are we need to do more work to understand the relationships from a statistical perspective, but well, Ben does. Um, we'll also be looking at other things because we can plug in other things um uh, relatively easily like some demographic data um because i'm wondering about the students i was just gonna yeah so i'm wondering about the students who are, are up here for instance versus the ones who are down here uh and i'm wondering if there's a, a you know a demographic uh, feature of of of, of those that could actually refine our, our target our intervention uh, uh, more closely. Uh, I'm going to do some uh, focus groups with the students who fall into that category to try and understand what they're doing for you know 230 hours. What could they possibly be doing for 230 hours? Um, and we're going to relatively quickly uh, generate a predictive uh, model, which, as I say, we can pick up struggling students after three weeks instead of nine weeks, ten weeks, uh, using this method. And 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 uh, I'm working with the um, uh, with the skills center in the library to actually set up a special program that that is that is because. These students, I think, have really be, been underserviced. The ones who are actually prepared to put in the time and effort, but are really struggling. Um, because at the end of the year, they're just going to be dismissed as failures, not, not, uh, and, and the effort they've been putting in will, will, will go largely unrecognized. Um, and uh, yeah, at, at its simplest level, it's just identifying students spending double the amount of double the mean time in the VLE. Uh, yeah, we don't have to wait for exam scores. We can use this after two or three weeks. Yeah, we may have we, we may have discovered a relatively simple correlation that it's the thing is that the this is a relatively small number of students. But it's not an insignificant number of students. It's somewhere between five and ten percent of the cohort uh, that are falling into this category. So, although it's a small number, it's it's uh, it's it's not insignificant. Um, I, I, I sort of rattled through that because uh, the last time I did this, we, we had a really conversation, a really good conversation afterwards. So, I'm hoping that there are some questions. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, the the investigation, particularly from the data analytics perspective, give us some quantitative the, the the relationship between the engagement with the outstanding outcomes. So, any questions? 
or the Sylvania posters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Hi. I just want to this is sorry, I don't know if you get like psychology. Are these students who are studying entirely online? No, no, no. So, so if we if if we'd done this study five six years ago, we would have had virtually that that correlation, the basic correlation, probably wouldn't have existed in most most cases. Uh, I think it's I think it's I think it was heading this way. I think the pandemic has uh, uh, shot up a bit in terms of most academics are now aware of the VLE and how to use it a bit more effectively than they were before the pandemic um so we're we're it's not just a repository for a huge amount of academics now it is used in a much more uh, um deliberate way no no and and, and to be honest that I, I, no, I don't. I, I do know that our university, like most others, has struggled with physical attendance. Um, I have no idea about, but but to be honest, that was the purpose of doing this, was that I didn't want to know anything about anything else. I just wanted to know, given just some raw data, is there anything I can say about this group of students? Is there anything I can, uh, uh, you know, how can I identify them early? Um, and that's why that's why I found it interesting to do a number of disciplines. I didn't even look at the VLE pages for the modules I looked at. So I have literally no idea what the learning design was in them um, or what, what, how many content items there were. I know where there's some I know that there were some videos only because I went to check the Panopto to see if it had the same correlation. So how do you measure the time restraint in the content pages? If you go to a page, obviously you've got a time stamp, how do you measure when you stop the content? Well, generally when you look at the content, that's your own web page, not like download the word or video. Exactly. It's it's um it's a blunt instrument. It, it absolutely is. You can't tell if they go into a page and then just leave it open and go make a cup of coffee. Absolutely can't do that. Um, you can't tell it. Obviously, they could be downloading it and then switching it off. Could absolutely be doing that. Um, uh, so no, it's it, it is absolutely a blunt instrument, but it does measure it does measure the amount of seconds they spend with that page open and with it, it, it with it um, like a, as the primary window. As soon as they click out of that window, it stops it stops the timing. But the thing is, as I said before. Once you get up to more than double, three or four times the average, the odd cup of coffee or whatever is not going to make, uh, there's still something to be said there. Is there, no. Sorry. Okay. Is, is, there is there any way to tell um, what device the students are using to engage? So may there be a correlation for the students that are um, performing lower with mobile devices? Uh, uh, the, the, yeah interesting yeah really interesting um uh, yeah that's another thing to plug in uh, yes we can find out no i didn't um so so for the purposes of this i didn't but it, we we absolutely can um and and that's something else to consider when we're looking at plugging in demographics you know which which route they came to university by and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so uh, I just uh, come to the time and I have a final question, I think, because we have so many people that are so for the question. Um, you were talking at the start about kind of splitting off the behavioral side of engagement people, uh, emotional and cognitive. Yeah. I wonder what your signal is about how you might sort of recombine the emotional and the cognitive back into this. Well, that's, well, I, guess, to do. well I, I think I think certainly some of the more complex models definitely involve the cognitive. Um, you know, they, they, they can they can start, but but we, uh, my institution, I just don't have the resource. I I'd love to be able to do it. I'd love to be able to look at how they're engaging with specific items. You know, uh, are there are there specific items that they that this group pick up on that the others don't or that you know what are what are the really 
what are the really successful students, you know, in this sort of area? What are they doing? Uh, how are they uh, in, in engaging with it? I, I they, yeah, there are so many great questions, and and um, but with a really limited resource, I have to use a relatively blunt instrument. Okay, so let us so thank you, the calling. Thank you very much.